Hello Levy here and welcome to my review of the Corsair IQ H150i RGB Pro XT. A long name for a 360mm AIO from Corsair. Speaking of which, Corsair did send this one over to me for review and it is the most expensive thing I've reviewed on this channel. So perhaps if you want to take this review with a pinch of salt I guess, uh, although I am keeping this as real as I possibly can. Skip to the conclusion, there are timestamps in the video description if you really want to see exactly what I think of this and, and whether or how I would recommend it. Um, because you can recommend anything to anyone, it just depends on their circumstances to whether it is appropriate for them. Speaking of which, there are Amazon affiliate links or associate links in the video description. Uh, the naming of which I... Uh, uh, so they are in the video description. There are three links there for the 240, 280 and 360mm version. This might not be relevant for you, but a smaller version may. Uh, again, conclusion at the end to clarify that. And regardless of anything else, I hope you enjoy the review and I'll catch you in a second to get this thing started. So this is the first 360mm AIO slash radiator I've had on this channel. I was just about to tackle a budget one, but Corsair beat it out of the blocks with the IQ H150i RGB Pro XT with a 5 year warranty. Nice. Anyway, less chat and more action. Thanks for the support Corsair and the recyclable and apparently compostable molded pulp packaging. Mounting hardware wise we've got everything to cover mainstream AMD sockets, the TR4 socket and mainstream Intel sockets, in addition to the hardware for the pump and enough long screws for 6 fans. Onto the radiator, well it's a 360mm radiator so there's not much to say there, but it has a smooth finish and a shiny Corsair sticker. Of course I see the shiny and rub my fingers all over it instantly, then try to reverse it with a microfiber cloth. Don't do that, you'll be picking fluff out of it for days. Last point before I move on, these recesses seem a little unusual, but not off-putting, just odd and I thought I'd highlight them in case you don't like them. Anyway, let's move on to the pump. The pump has an irregular octagonal shape, but that's not the most interesting part, it also has holes in the side. Yeah, joking aside, there's not a huge amount to tell just from a cursory look. But Corsair being Corsair, we've got 16 addressable RGB LEDs under the hood, all of which are controlled through the side USB port. The pump speed is also controlled via USB, not through the motherboard, but there is a 3-pin fan connector with only one wire. As far as I understand, that will report back to the motherboard that something is running. While we're here, the pump is powered by a SATA power connector and there are three 4-pin PWM fan connectors to allow you to control all the fans as well as the pump speed and lighting through Corsair's IQ software which is really rather good. I didn't end up controlling the fans through the software for testing since I've got my own setup, but the pump was set to quiet for the acoustic testing and performance for the full speed testing. Before we move on to the insole, I wanted to take a close look at the base plate which is predominantly bare copper. It comes with pre-applied thermal paste which I immediately wiped away. Sorry if that hurts but I'm testing the performance of the unit not the thermal paste and to make testing as fair as possible we need to limit the variables. Now let's take an even closer look at the base plate. I set some digital calipers to very nearly 1mm for reference and closed in on the cooler. This isn't very scientific I know, in the wrong light the grooves don't look great, but in the right light it appears very smooth, and with that in mind it's unfortunate there's a chasm in the side of the base plate. Is it going to noticeably affect performance? Not likely, which is probably why it passed QC. Is it a shame to see? Yeah it is, but it's an invisible scar once installed so it's not a big deal. So let's move on to the install. Anyone on Patreon will have already seen this being made and working. It's my highly compatible minimal resistance radiator mounting bracket that's disguised as an L-shaped channel with holes in it. It's not pretty, but it's pretty good at its job. As for mounting the radiator to it, well, I thought I came across a potential issue. When it comes to mounting the radiator to the chassis of your case, you need to call on the shorter screws Corsair provides with some washers. If you've dabbled in radiators before, you might also be curious as to why these screws are so long. Compared to a short radiator screw from EK, there's quite the size difference. My initial thought was these screws are definitely going to mangle up some fins until I realized that the fins below all the screw holes are already malformed to account for this. So perhaps Corsair has been in the game long enough to know that installing a radiator is easier with longer screws by hand initially, and then breaking out a screwdriver to finish, rather than shorter screws by hand and or with a tool, and going the extra step to provide longer screws and opening up the gap in the fins is better all round. It's a reason for it I guess. 
So there we have it, an installed radiator on the mostly unrestricted mounting bracket. Now for the pump and CPU block. Since this is an Intel mainstream socket, we need to use the provided backplate. It's held in place by a set of standoffs which form the mount for the block, then the thermal paste can be applied, which I rubbed off. This is MX4, which is my test thermal paste, and the block can be mounted on top and secured by the thumb screws. Nothing we haven't seen before, but as a mounting solution, it's nice and simple, leaving no complaints. Quickly covering the fans, we've got three Corsair ML120s that are set to spin up to 2400 RPM, which is very fast for a case fan. However, not something you'll likely be using when you've strapped it to the radiator unless you're a closed back noise cancelling headphone user. The ML section of the name stands for Magnetic Levitation, and according to Corsair in the review guide, if NASA designed a fan, this would be it. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that kind of statement, it makes me think, surely NASA has designed fans before, which is then followed up by a search for NASA fan design on Google that results in finding a 277 page report written in 1977 from the NASA Lewis Research Center called Detail Design of a Quiet High Flow Fan, which didn't contain the word magnetic or levitation, and about nine of the reports of a similar ilk on the first page search can be found. Now, I'm not trying to sound like a smarmy git for pointing out the obvious, but someone's got to point this out before just saying anything to make something sound cooler becomes even more normal. If the fans are that good, just stick to the facts and avoid saying suspicious things. Alright, now we've covered pretty much everything, let's test this thing out and see how it performs. We'll start with the toughest test, Primity 5, which pushes the CPU to output roughly 90 watts of heat, and we're running the fan slowed down to meet the acoustic target. This is the acoustic version of this test. You can see the H150i is doing really well in comparison to most of the coolers on the board, but not all the coolers. It's right next to the Scythe Mugen 5, and this is where we might be discovering the limit of cooling with the acoustically limited setup. We'll have to get in some other monster coolers to find that out exactly. It's worth noting the Scythe Mugen 5 is a 155mm tall air cooler, whereas the H150i is a 360mm AIO. Now that might sound wrong that they're neck and neck, but we'll get onto that towards the end. For now, let's press forward with the results. The same test now, but we have set the fans to full speed. Here the H150i has opened up a significant lead from the Mugen 5, but of course running three fans at just shy of 2400rpm through a radiator isn't a recipe for silence. So the H150i isn't just top of the leaderboard here in terms of lowest thermals, but also top of the leaderboard in noise output weighing in at over 52 decibels with an A weighting. Which doesn't mean much until you consider the quietest on the board is 37 dBA and the second loudest which is pretty noisy at 44 dBA. Fun fact, the H150i is the first cooler where I've worn noise cancelling headphones throughout its full speed testing. Moving on, now we've switched back to the acoustically limited fan speed, but with the Firestrike combined loop test which outputs roughly 60 watts from the CPU, here we're seeing a repeat of the Prime 95 testing with the Mugen 5 and H150i neck and neck. And spinning those fans up to full speed sees the H150i push out in front with the caveat of the increased noise we discussed earlier. Now here's where I circle back to the whole Mugen 5 being an air cooler and performing really well compared to the Monster H150i 360mm AIO. Let's pull up the rough price graph to go through this and give more context. So the H150i will set you back a good £170, €180 Euros, or $150, whereas the Mugen 5 will only set you back about €50 Euros or pounds. When we use these figures to create a price versus performance graph where lower is better value for money, the Mugen 5 is a pretty decent deal, whereas the H150i is an astonishingly bad deal. This is where I call back to the review of the PC Cooler S83, which is the best value cooler on the board. That best value statistic was generated from its dirt cheap price heavily outweighing its poor performance. Even though it has the best value for money, its performance was so poor that it doesn't really meet what most would likely deem the minimum requirements of cooling performance for mainstream CPUs. 
Why do I bring this up as a tool to describe the H150i? Well, like the S83 wasn't able to get the most out of the 6700K, the 6700K isn't really able to get the most out of the H150i. If you've got a CPU that's hitting 90 watts max in any scenario, sustained or not, sure the H150i would keep it nice and cool at a low noise output, but so would a large air cooler at one third of the cost. This monster of a cooler would yield better value for money with a monster CPU. A CPU so monstrous that something like the Scythe Mugen 5 would be struggling and in a position similar to the S83 is with the 6700K. At that point, the H150i would be better value for money since it can sufficiently cool the monster CPU. Now, what is the point of consideration for the H150i? Well, Corsair recommends reviewers to test it with a CPU that can output at least 140 watts, heading up to 200 watts, more than double of my 6700K's output in its current configuration. We're talking high-end Ryzen CPUs heading into Threadripper and Intel Extreme Edition CPUs. That should give you a good indication of when you should start to consider the H150i from a purely reasonable performance and value for money standpoint, minus objective values like RGB of course. So not necessarily a glowing conclusion for the H150i, but uh, it depends on the way you look at it. So if you look at it from a perspective of it, it's just going to cool a mainstream CPU, then yes, it will absolutely cool pretty much most mainstream CPUs. So anything Ryzen 7 wise and you sort of your mainstream Intel CPUs, you know what I mean? Um, anything around those kind of that ballpark that uh, TDP is lower than 100 watts, TDP is lower than 100 watts. Um, yeah, it's going to be fine pretty much for everything and they'll keep it super super cool regardless of what you throw it in but then again so would a, a big air cooler like a d15s or the mugen 5 or or a dark rock 4 don't even need to go for the pro 4 just the dark rock 4 that will keep that cool in pretty much any scenario as well regardless of what you throw at it for a mainstream consumer or a mainstream cpu but if you push up to say intel uh, extreme editions and you've got your high-end ryzen's like i said and your thread rippers this is probably going to be more relevant at that point because they're pushing a lot more wattage and like Corsair recommends in its review guide, you know, at least 140 watts heading towards 200 is what they expect to get a good, uh, a good idea of how this thing actually performs um, rather than 90 watts. So my conclusion can only really be from my testing is that if you're looking for mainstream stuff and good price to performance, this ain't it. You might be looking more at the 240 version. You might be looking at the 280 version. 360 is probably a little bit too far. And yeah, that's basically all I can say about it. It's hard for me to recommend this thing based on what I've tested. So if you're, push if you're using a mainstream CPU and you're looking for a cooler, this will be a great performer, but it isn't the price to performance king that you might necessarily look more towards as a realistic proposition. Probably better off going for air cooling. But if you're looking at something more extreme, then go and look at, go and seek out some figures that are, that are closer to using a CPU closer to what you're looking at and wattages that what you're looking at um, in terms of the CPU you're getting. Because then you'll get a realistic answer of whether this is worth the money you're spending. $150, $170, pounds, whatever, it, whatever it is, is too much if you're only pushing 90 watts. It's not, not reasonable enough. Same as 100. Go high, go big air cooler or smaller AIO. And they do offer that with the 240 version. So that's all my conclusion can be. Thank you so much for checking this one out. I hope that was real enough. Uh, and if you want to check out more videos, please, videos over there. Uh, subscribe and support the channel on that side. And I'll catch you in the next one, which will be, which will be a cheap 360mm AIO cooler, which cool review, which should be interesting. As well as I've got cases lined up, which should be really cool. Uh, I've got the AirCool 1 coming in. I've got the uh, Forge 100R coming in, which should be awesome. Uh, and those two will be a great mashup. So thanks for checking this one out. Catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.